So I began to say that in this strategy of the group of 12 or the principle of 12, that Jesus established this principle as a strategy to build his church. And to do that, he chose 12 ordinary unlearned people whom he discipled and mentored for three years and then he entrusted the whole world to them. Now I suppose that the reason Jesus pulled out 12 uh, men who were not um, learned so to say, who were not schooled in the times we know it today, they were ordinary fishermen. And at one point in their life, when they stood before the people and they were declaring the counsel of God, the learned people at that time began to say, how come these men are able to say this and do this? And the only reason they could understand why these men could do what they were doing was because they had been with Jesus. So in other words, this principle will work whether you are learned or unlearned. I didn't hear you say amen. amen. So don't be intimidated. Anybody can use this principle whether you are in the village, whether you are ministering to unlearned people, whether you, do, you are out there in the remote villages or in the forest, anywhere you take this principle to, it will work for you. I said it will work for you. Amen. Glory to God Almighty. And yesterday I also asked this question and I said, what is it that those unlearned ordinary people got from Jesus that was enough for them to win the whole world? And I gave you three things. And number one was they received a revelation of his life. The life of Christ in those three years or three and a half years. They literally swallowed the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus was literally translated or transferred or infused into their life. They watched Jesus day and night. Every day of those three and a half years, they sat with Jesus. They watched him do everything. They watched him sleep. They saw him as he is. And there was nothing of Jesus that was hidden from them. It was a transfer of life. It was an impartation of life. It was not an issue of just talking to their psyche. There was something that transpired between those disciples, those 12 men, and Jesus Christ in those three and a half years. Number two, they received the strategy of the G12 principle because they were Jesus out of the multitude of the people that gathered to Jesus day and night, eating bread, getting healed, getting delivered. In the midst of those multitudes that followed Jesus day and night, they watched him choose 12 of them and separated the 12 to himself. And after he has done what he needed to do to the public, he goes back in a separate remote places. And in the night, he stays with the 12. And in the day, he had the time with the 12. They watched him and they were able to catch this principle that this is exactly how they should raise their own disciples. I mean, I just need you to really, really understand every line I am making, every phrase I am making. If we can understand this, you will have a glorious ministry. I said you will have a glorious ministry. If you can understand this, you are unlimited. No one can limit your ministry.
And number three, there was an impartation of his spirit. There was an impartation of his spirit. Now what has happened is that many of us, many of us, has made up our mind to get an impartation of spirit without a strategy. Watch this. You need to understand these three things. They receive the revelation of his life. So when we talk about the G12, we're talking about life, life, life. Not, the, not doctrine, life. That's why anybody can do it. And the strategy and the impartation of the spirit. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Verse 13 and 14. Mark chapter 3. Verse 13 and 14. And the scripture says. And he went up on the mountain. And called to him those he himself wanted. He called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. And then he appointed the twelve, or he separated the twelve, that they might be with him. He ordained the twelve. He called the twelve to him, and that they might be with him, that they might be with him, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Again, in those period of three and a half years Jesus reproduced his life and his character in each of them and showed them what it was to have a true encounter with him until they became full of Jesus and they were ready to multiply Jesus in many lives they didn't just get a doctrine of Jesus they got the life of Jesus now watch this and I said the G12 principle is a success strategy for world evangelism for church planting and for raising disciples and developing sons that will last this principle of the 12 or this G12 principle will give you the perfect strategy a balanced biblical strategy for church planting, for raising disciples, and for developing sons that will last. In this strategy of the G12, Jesus established the secret of success to discipleship and discipling the nations. The secret of success to discipleship and discipling the nations. If you can understand this principle, if you can receive this G12 principle, you will have success in your discipleship and you will have success in going to the nations and discipling that nation. I didn't hear you say amen. amen. In this G12 principle, Jesus also showed us the process of spiritual reproduction and multiplication for his church. This principle will show you the process of spiritual reproduction. The process of spiritual reproduction. Say with me, the process of spiritual reproduction. Say like you mean it. Say the process of spiritual reproduction and multiplication for the church that's what you're going to learn that's what you're going to learn that's what you're going to receive that's what you're going to run with praise God Matthew chapter 28. Let's look at the commission one more time. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 
And Jesus came and spoke to them. I'm reading from verse 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples, make disciples, make disciples of all the nations. And then baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you even to the end of the age. So watch this now. The assignment. The assignment is to go to the world. To go to the world. Which we call evangelism. That's not my assignment. And then make disciples. As you go. As you preach. It doesn't stop in the preaching. Your work is not complete in just preaching. Then you make disciples. And then you teach them to observe. You make disciples. And then you teach them to observe. I'm going to explain to you in the process of this teaching, maybe not today, but tomorrow or something like that. The difference between making disciples and teaching. Sometimes we miss it up and we don't understand the demarcations. That you can actually spend your time teaching people who are not disciples. So, in this thing, we make disciples and we teach. We make disciples and then we teach. I told you that making disciples is a transfer of life. It involves your life. It involves your life. Don't forget this. In order to understand this strategy, you need to understand the difference between the disciple, making disciple and, and teaching. Because I'm going to help you see that you can spend your life teaching people and yet have no disciples. It's very important you understand this little element I'm trying to explain. We have many teachers in the body today which has its place. You cannot build the church without teaching. But you can have a collection of multitude that are listening to your teachings, yet they are not your disciples. And at the end, you found out that no one is really following you. You have not imparted any life at all, but you have taught many people. Oh, are you with me? So the thing is, the commission, this commission, as we know it, making disciples, was given to the disciples or to the believers not necessarily at that time to the fivefold ministry leaders as we have them today. Pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers. At that time, this leadership gift was not given at that time. But Jesus was speaking to his disciples. They were just simply disciples. In other words, this assignment is for everyone who becomes a disciple. Everyone who becomes a disciple. Whether you have a position as a pastor or you have a position as a designated evangelist or, a, or whichever it might be, the position we were looking for in the church. Don't say, it, I'm not called to fivefold ministry, so therefore I'm not, my, my assignment is not to make disciples. I will show you and all that is required from your life, on the end of your life, is to raise disciples. 
whichever capacity that God might place you. I heard God's servant, Pastor David, say that your profession or your talent is not your calling, it's your platform. Have you heard him say that before? As we develop all the talents and all different professions that we are privileged to have, your primary assignment is to make disciples. So making disciples is the apostolic mandate. I strongly believe that the church should be apostolic in mind and apostolic in action. And through apostolic ministry makes disciples. Through apostolic ministry makes disciples. So a church that is not built on the foundation of discipleship we gather a crowd yet lives are not changed so for a church to move in the dimension of the apostolic ministry which is making primarily making disciples we need to understand that the whole church must experience discipleship and indeed become disciples so what we are looking at is the fact that if I would sit in our church, every one of us that is seated in this place must understand discipleship and must experience discipleship. You would have to have been a disciple so you can make another disciple. Again, you cannot make what you have not experienced. Much more, you cannot make what you are not. The difference between this discipleship and every other aspect of life or vocation or life, talent or, or profession is the fact that we are talking about life transfer, not just intellectual impartation or intellectual transfer. So in discipleship, it's not like being a teacher in a secondary school or being a teacher or a professor in the university where you come before the people and you give them knowledge and you give them some innovations, but the people are not looking onto you to receive your life. You are not even looking on and, and believing them to receive your life. You are not there to give them your life. You are simply there to give them information. But in this thing called discipleship, we are dealing with life transfer. We are dealing with life changes. That's why you must make up your mind. You must be a disciple. Because it is only what you have experienced that you can transfer. It is only what you become that you can make. So in the light of this, look at discipleship versus vocation or profession. In the beginning, when Jesus met those fishermen in the first place, he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What does that mean? It means that he was trying to show them, I have another assignment. I have a greater assignment. But for the fact that he knows they are committed to something, which is their vocation and their trade. He said, now, from now on, you are going to be looking for men instead of fish. 
Now, fish represent any other profession or vocation. I want you to understand the dimension between giving your life to men or, or, and giving your life to vacation or to a trade. Those men had no relationship with fish. They cannot build a relationship with fish. But Jesus now gave them another assignment and said, I'm going to make you raise men for me. There's a shifting in the understanding. There's a shifting in their life that is going to take place that would not take place if they were just looking for fish. So now, I need you to hear this. The first responsibility of a Christian is not just to become, is not to become a successful entrepreneur or a business person or an or, or educated person, but to become a successful disciple maker. Let me repeat what I said. The first responsibility of a Christian is to become a successful disciple maker. So who is a disciple? Among many definitions of who a disciple is, I just have a few here that I need to share with you. So as we go on learning this principle or this strategy, you are going to be understanding what is being a disciple and then how to make one. All right? Are you with me? Who is a disciple? And I'm going to show you... Um, The practical dimension of being a disciple from what we call theological disciples. There is many definitions given to discipleship which doesn't make it real. And one of these definitions is this, sir. That people say a disciple, that's where they stop. A disciple is the one who follows Jesus. So we are making disciples of Jesus. Which is correct, but it's not complete. It's not complete. A disciple is a person who has made a personal and a public confession of Christ and has willfully submitted to a leader. A disciple is a person who has made a public or a personal confession of Christ and then he will make a shift, he or she will make a shift to submit himself or herself to a leader to be taught, to be trained, to be mentored with the goal of becoming a leader in the order of that leader in Christ. Let me go over this. So in this discipleship, this G12 principle, I need you to know what happened between those 12 men and Jesus so that we can understand how to do it ourselves. A person has made a commitment to Christ, a confession of Christ. A person has believed in the work of Christ. A person has believed Jesus as the Savior and as the Lord. But in order to become a practical disciple, you need to submit yourself to another person, to another leader. 
In other words, you are not just following Christ, but you are following a practical person that you can see. Just like the disciples, they were seeing a practical Jesus. Oh, I needed to practically get what I'm talking about. Listen, when Jesus came, Jesus was not primarily trying to reveal himself to the people or show himself to the people. He was concerned about the people getting back to God, getting back to God, getting to know God. The idea was there. This is a father that people do not know that Jesus came to reveal. But in order for the people to know God, in order for the people to follow God, they have to follow Jesus there. They can see. Are you catching this? So there was a practical person. Jesus was not an imaginary person. It was not an illusion. It was not a theology. It was a real person with flesh and blood. The reason I'm making you to understand this dimension is that there are people who have made up their mind they will not follow anybody because they didn't give their life to anybody. So they want to follow Jesus that they have never seen before. So when we talk about discipleship, we're talking about practical life. It's change of practical life. Not just an idea, not just a theology, but a life that you can see, that you can touch, that you can communicate to. And, and, and your goal is to follow that person to follow Christ. You know, Apostle Paul says to Timothy, follow me. Or he says to the Corinthians, say, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So you've got to understand that in the process of becoming a disciple, you are going to follow somebody. You are going to submit yourself to somebody that you can see, that you can touch, that you can communicate with. Are you with me? Glory to God Almighty. The only way to measure your success is, is to, that, that your success is going to be a practical measurement. You wouldn't know if you have a disciple. You wouldn't know you're making a disciple if there were nobody who was following you. Amen. So in this G12 strategy, discipleship is measurable, is, is measurable, it's tangible. Somebody say it's tangible. So a disciple is a person whose sole motive is to follow his leader and become like him in Christ. In other words, it's a voluntary decision to pattern your life into somebody else who is ahead of you in following Christ. So there is Christ there, and there is your disciple there, and there is you like this. Just like in Jesus' time, there is the God the Father that can't see him, right? They can't see him, but they could see Jesus. So in order to follow God, they have to follow Jesus that could see. Now, in our own dispensation, we don't see Jesus physically. The only way we can get the life and live the life is to follow somebody who already knew Jesus before us. We can't see Jesus, but we can see somebody else. Glory. Are you getting this? Ah, yeah, my, yeah, my, yeah. So Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6 verse 40, he said, A disciple is not greater than his teacher, but everyone when fully trained will become like his teacher. So get this, don't sit in your house or sit in your seat 
and think, well, I gave my life to Jesus. I don't care about anybody. I'm not going to follow anybody. I'm not going to submit to anybody. It is Jesus that I'm following. Let's think. Regardless of how you encounter Christ, regardless of how the revelation of Jesus that you have, you need somebody to help you live the life. Someone who is already living the life of Christ before. You need to look at that person because the person has flesh and blood like you do. Are you with me? Apostle Paul is a picture of what it means to encounter Christ in a very dramatic, unusual way. Yet, he could not be a Christian or he could not follow Christ until he gave himself to all the people that have known Christ before him. Can you remember the story? How that the Lord himself has to lead him to someone else who had to pray for him, who had to lay hands upon him, and he stayed with disciples for some, some period of time. And he, and he watched them. Come on now. He had seen Jesus, but then Jesus was not real in a practical sense because he didn't see Jesus every day. He didn't wake up every morning and see Jesus sitting down by his bedside. But he could see the other ones who had known Jesus before him, who had to for, to, 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 to lead him step by step, day by day, and teach him what... Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, I need you to get it. Until you understand this process and this, and this strategy, you are going to have a big head. A big head with no result. You will not be a big head. I said you will not be a big head. <laughs> Every believer needs to be trained by somebody else. Every believer needs to be trained by somebody else. Needs to be raised by somebody else. Needs to be established by somebody else. When God took me from Islam, I went too far than you can understand. I had a very, very practical experience. Jesus came to the room where I was all by myself. And he took me, he wrapped his hand around me. As practical as I'm talking now, that's what he did. I felt his hand wrap me like this. And he filled me with the Holy Spirit right there. And I spoke in tongues for two hours, non-stop. Nobody laid hands on me. And for three months, I spoke in tongues. Anytime I want to tell you what happened, I will start speaking in tongues. Three months, I could not talk like a normal person. I fell in love with Jesus right there for those three months. But I could not have become what I am today. Except that at a point in my life, I practically gave my life to somebody else. I was actually living in the church. I would stay in the church throughout the whole day, sir. The pastor became like the Jesus I could see. I would go home. I don't know which time I ate and which time I didn't eat. I was in love with Jesus. But I needed to follow somebody. Because I could not see Jesus every day, even though I know he touched me one day, practically. I would spend all my whole day in the church. I wanted to do everything everybody was doing. There's an evangelism team, I want to follow them. There's a prayer team, I want to... I was not waiting to be invited to do anything. It was with that speed... That's it, sir. No one wants to fool anybody. And listen, in this strategy I'm going to show you why leaders, why leaders are not making disciples. 
I will tell you, by the grace of God, why we are not making disciples. But you will live here knowing how to make disciples, and you will make disciples. Yeah. I said you will make disciples. Yeah. I see you successful in ministry. Yeah. Praise God Almighty. Praise God. Yes, sir. What does it mean? Well, in this kingdom called the church, I told you that the church is the depot. The church is the depot of God on earth. It's the legacy of God. Everything God is doing, everything Christ is doing, is doing it through the church. I understand this discipleship is the church ministry. It's the church life. Okay? All right? So in this kingdom called the church, every disciple is the leader. In other words, every disciple is a disciple maker in the process. And what does it mean to make disciples? Making disciples means to go and multiply yourself or to reproduce yourself in the order that you were made in Christ. To reproduce yourself into another life in the same order, in the same DNA or dimension of spiritual practicality that you were made into others. It means to bear fruit according to your kind. It means to reproduce your kind of people. Whatever you are, you have a world to live in. And I'll get there. I'll get there. I won't go into this now. Amen? So, I will share this. Some of the errors that has crept in to the church today, and it's making it difficult for us to really live and make disciples. Many coming leaders, many new generation leaders have adopted a more or less have adopted a more or less committed method and have assumed that all we have to give to people are materials until they feel they have enough knowledge. So when we come to a meeting like this, we are looking for handouts, we are looking for printouts, we are looking for materials, printed materials. Just give it to me, let me go home and read it. It's not enough to make disciples. We need the printed materials. We need a reference. That's why we have the scripture. That's why we have the Bible. But it's not enough to just have materials or give people materials. And if that's what we think we are doing, just collecting materials or giving materials to people, we have not followed the commission. Please understand that in essence, really, I want to say something um, that is subject to adjustment. Um, by Dr. Dave, my friend, if he doesn't agree with that. But this is what I believe. Uh, Jesus has not asked us to go build churches. He has asked us to go make disciples, and then he will build his church. Please catch this now. Catch this now. That's why, because of this conception that you are called to go build a church, so the first thing that comes to your mind when you think you are called is that you need some money. You need a large money, so you want to be in a very strategic location, and you want to have a very strategic building and you want to design a modern tech building and all of those things. So you are looking for some millions of naira to start. You haven't started because you needed all the equipments and all the materials and all of those things that will attract people. Your, the first assignment is not to build a church. 
Your first assignment is to make disciples. And Jesus will build his church. Can I hear amen? amen. Now, other people have this uh, method of what we call marketing trend today. Why do church leaders, listen to me, why do church leaders spend time doing everything but making disciples? Why do they have to all the things they do, literally, but they're not making disciples? You understand that church leaders have tried every church growth formula. They're trying to gather huge crowds, trying to build massive buildings, publish books, make cities and DVDs, preach on radios and TVs, and even have political positions. We organize all manner of revivals, healing revivals, laughing revivals, weeping revivals, prayer revivals, repenting, prosperity, breakthrough revivals. Yet we have ignored the simple commission, go and make disciples. A man doesn't have a disciple, but he already printed handbills. Well, well, that's evangelism. But listen, he already, he already made, prepared his CDs. If he doesn't have disciples, but he had CDs. He has sleeves of his pictures in his distance, and he hasn't made any disciple yet. Listen, listen, listen. We have built faith churches, wide garment churches. House churches, organic churches, prayer churches, new generation churches, prophetic healing churches. But have we made disciples? Have we made disciples? You need to understand the, this, this thing that is going on in what we call churches today. A man comes to Enugu. Listen very well so you don't make this a mistake. A man comes to Enugu. And he had money. He had sourced some resources. And he got himself a good location. He bought all the, all the latest techniques, technologies, and installed it in his church. And he printed hand bills. And he goes around pasting those bills. And he goes to the TV. And he spoke for some minutes, inviting people to come to the church. And the first Sunday, he will have about 200 people. If you look critically to those 200 people, none of them were an unbeliever. They were coming from other churches. Is that what people do? And he will continue doing this thing in program, run the church as a program. All he does is to run programs from one week to another month. Every month there's a dimension of programs. And, and then he continues. Every year there are five programs in the year. And this program is meant to attract people from other churches. And before you know it, it has 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 people. Look there. Some of the people in that church has been in other churches in five other churches before they came to that place. And everybody that gathers around there goes into that dimension. So you come, they give you a handbill, you go out and invite another Christian anyway. And he comes and the church keeps multiplying, yet we are not making the disciples. And lives are not being changed. That's not the commission. I can tell you this. That's not discipleship. And that's what is killing our generation today. And then we have innovative teachings. Teach, again, I told you discipleship is more than just teaching doctrinal materials. We have decided to teach instead of making disciples. Again, the problem is that if we substitute discipleship with just teaching materials, we end up trying to teach people who are not yet born again. They are not believers in the first place. Discipleship is more than just gathering people and delivering a lesson. And then watch this. So, oh, I don't have time for this now, but I'll continue this tomorrow. Now listen, I have tomorrow and next tomorrow. I took this whole time to show you the wrong way. From tomorrow and next tomorrow, don't ever miss it. Because you are going to have a practical principle, a practical 
principle, strategy to multiply yourself. Can I hear amen? amen. Listen. Before I, know, before, I, before I got this principle, being in a nation of 98% Islams, you need to hear, you need to know how people say it. It's hard. They say it is hard to win people here to build churches or to plant churches. They say it's hard. I thought it was hard too. At that time, I was struggling with two churches. But in the last few six years, which is not the speed I should have, but at least the difference is clear. From that two churches, we have 164 churches today. And listen, and by the way, I need to let you know this, that Dr. David is committed to what we do in the nation of Niger and Mali and Burkina Faso. Last year, he helped us plant 10 churches, 10 churches, 10. Thank you, sir. You see, so every year, we have a goal to plant 15 churches every year. 15 churches every year. You see, when you have this, when you understand this principle, you will have more disciples, more leaders, more church planters in your hands that you can even know what to do with them. That's what I can assure you. I want you to really understand it's a shifting. What Jesus did is not what people are thinking today. And I know there's a sacrifice to pay for it. And I will tell you how gradually you can do this. So let's get back to what Jesus did. And let's disciple the nations. And let's take the nation for God. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you.